Meghan was utterly deluded about what she thought being married to Prince Harry was. Kate is, I think, one of the most amazing figures in this entire story. Charles has no mystique, and the Queen had the mystique of 70 years of history, and she never gave an interview. I do think that it is the Oprah in, in, uh, interview that really changed things. It was it, that it, that was a major, major damaging moment. What I, you know, it, yes, it, the, the Oprah interview made it very hard to 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 patch things up with his family. But he's also it's what he's continued to do as well mm. that really affects them. I mean, he recently went on television before the Jubilee. You know, when he was on his way to when he was mm. uh, went to to Europe to do his Invictus Games, his his Special Olympics, which has been a very successful and and good effort by Harry. Um, You know, that was a wonderful occasion. But what did he do? He went on television and said, oh, I went to see the Queen because I wanted to make sure the people around her, uh, she had the right people around her. I was worried that she didn't have the right people around Mm -hmm. her. I mean, you know, for someone who's been missing for two years uh, in California, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of implication that the family were not doing a good job of looking after the Queen greatly offended everybody i mean everybody to the point that there was real fury about that it's like how dare you you know come on on a flyby you know make these comments about us so he keeps on doing it which i don't really understand i mean it's it's like he feels the need to keep lobbing bombs and it's it's i think mostly driven by this great sense of grievance he has that you know the terms on which he left the country in so-called mexit were absolutely not what he wanted, but he was the one who blew it, and he will not accept the fact that he blew it. And in fact, just this week, um, uh, it proved a point that I make in the book, where I talk about how Harry just doesn't understand what the real whole family should and do understand, which is that the Queen is two people. You know, she's yeah. granny, she's mummy, she's auntie, she's like a lovely lady in her of ninety six who delight, delights in her family, but. She's also the monarch. She is yeah. the CEO, you know, of the monarchy. Yeah. Yeah. And that will always come first with her in terms of what is right for the country, what is right for uh, how she sees uh, what is right, you know, in her role as monarch. And that means that when the family go to see the queen, they always know which person they're going to see. If they're going to see mummy, granny, whatever, it's going to be a delightful meeting. They're going to have tea. Everything will be lovely. But if it's if they're going to see anything that impacts on the constitution, the the future of the monarchy, the you know the the the, the sense of succession, all of these very big topics that you know where various aspects impact on the monarchy, they're going to see uh, uh, the monarch you know with her private secretaries in a, at a long table with notes being taken, and it will be a proper you know formal meeting. Yeah. Um, and, and and if you try to get around that. Um, it's not going to work. And the Queen is very tough uh, when she feels people are trying to get around that. She's very tough. I mean, she absolutely presided over the Mexit. It wasn't, you know, Harry likes to present it that sort of, you know, he came to England to meet with his grandmother. They were going to have a nice tea. And then her private secretary stepped in and yeah. thwarted him. And, you know, he keeps talking about the people, quote, round her. Uh, he's had famously bad terms with Sir Edward Young, her private secretary. He doesn't. He seemed very naive about the fact that actually the private secretary is doing what the Queen wants what? him to do, yeah. Yeah. and she, you know that giving her the deniability, if you like, that any any company leader at, at the top level has, which is yeah. that she doesn't want to say to Harry, "Look, I don't want to do this," you know. But so she'll have her private secretary say, "The Queen's diary is full." She mm. simply cannot meet you, as she said. She, you know, she mistook the date and said, mm. you know, you. Of course, he's doing it with the Queen's complicity. He's not going to go against the monarch's wishes, certainly. Mm. And if he had, he would be gone by now. But it's not yeah. Sir Edward Young that's gone. It's Harry that's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and just this week, uh, you saw another example of that. Harry's yeah. furious because he's found that you know he wants to have security. He wants Scotland Yard to protect yeah. him when he comes to London, which is a ridiculous idea. I mean, the Metropolitan Police in New York don't are not for hire. You know, I mean, yeah. they're the police force. And if you yeah. want private security, you hire your own private security. Yeah. You don't try to hire the police. So he will not accept this. And so he's gone to court about it. And now he's found that the, the, the palace had an impact in the decision to deny it to him. Of course, the palace did. Of course, yeah. of course, the palace was consulted. And when we talk about the palace, he says, Sir Edward Young, no, of course, the, of course, the Queen was consulted. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, 
and her private secretary delivered the, the verdict that she wished. But yeah. but Harry Harry keeps sort of fooling himself that the Queen is sort of off on the side being manipulated by yeah. her advice. I and mean, he sees her as his grandmother sort of being controlled by this. So you talk about Megan and you say that a lot you say that they this this is love right in the sense that she she gave him the tools to escape the royal family escape the cage that he was in and you said this. but so do, how much of this is actually this whole sort of angst that has been this thing is do you think is driven really by her um i mean do you think that this is also because he's british and she's american and they're just two different worlds and they haven't been able to, she hasn't yes, yes, yes. I mean, sort of all of the above. I mean, the fact is that Meghan was utterly deluded about what she thought being married to Prince Harry was. I mean, I make the sort of frankly uh, sort of ironic observation that here was Meghan, who was number six on the call sheet, as yeah. it's called, you know, you know, as an actress, that's number six on the list of people who are sort of descending importance about how they're going to be treated, et cetera, on the set of, 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 a, of a sitcom. And of course, Prince Harry is number six on the royal call sheet. He is not the Prince of Wales. He's not the heir to the throne. You know, he's the second son of the heir to the throne, yeah. brother, younger brother to the next heir to the throne. So he's quite low essentially, on the pecking order. And, you know, Meghan just hadn't done her homework. I mean, you know, she says on, she said on um, Oprah, yeah. you know, well, I didn't do any research. You bet she didn't. And I wish she had been able to read my book before she boarded the plane uh, yeah. for, for England because, uh, you know, she was completely deluded. She, she really did believe it was going to be fairy castles. She was going to be Princess Diana, uh, you know, traveling the world as the big humanitarian princess, uh, you know, in a kind of combination of Angelina Jolie and 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 Diana and Michelle and course, Obama, yeah, and Michelle Obama. And of course, it is not like that. I mean, you know, she she found herself in the end uh, unable to have a voice. That was her one of her great complaints. But you know, when you marry into monarchy, it's a bit like a secular version of taking the vow. You know, I mean, you you don't have your own private opinions. You're supposed to represent the country and to keep your private opinions to yourself while you are serving the monarchy and serving the British people. So that's the exact opposite of what Meghan wanted. Meghan wanted to be able to sound off at the, you know, at, at, at worldwide conferences and and uh, take make her issues the issues of the day. I yeah. can see how frustrating that was for a very accomplished career woman with an agenda. She was nearly, you know, 36. I mean, she's not a, not a young girl who doesn't have a voice. She's always had a voice and made it clear she wanted one. So for her, this was a nightmare. You know, she was stuck, frankly, I mean, as well in what she saw as a kind of underfunded uh, operation yeah. because, you know, her budget, the budget for, for the Sussexes was much, you know, was was, was way much down. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she didn't have the staff she wanted because, I mean, she had some staff, obviously, but she, she had wanted much more staffed and she wanted a much bigger platform, but the platform was what was decreed and she could not accept that. And then on top of that, you know, she didn't even have uh, a, a grand house. You know, I mean, she the, for the first year they lived in the little Not Nottingham cottage, which is a little Harry's kind of bachelor apartment, yeah. as it were, on the grounds of Kensington Palace. You know, I mean, there was no apartments in Kensington Palace that were going to be refurbished in time. It was going to take a couple of years to do that. So she goes off to you know to Frogmore, which is you know a lovely country house. Personally, I think it's heaven to be at Frogmore. Yeah, but you know. For her, she this is not what she wanted. I mean, she yeah. didn't. So, so she hated it. Um, a, she thought it was going to be a Walt Disney version of of. Yes. of she thought it was going to be a, a Walt Disney version, and she also, on top of that, found that the press were hostile after a time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the press in England are very, very tough. I mean, mm -hmm. they but they've all been through it. I mean, you know, as I say, you know, Camilla was called. Yeah. A hag and so on. I think they were racist when when uh, uh, the news of her was first uh, covered. I think there was definitely a sure. kind of uh, you know tabloid misogynistic racist uh, coloring to the coverage of her, which I think she rightly were felt outraged about. And and Harry was outraged about it and spoke about it. And then she also enraged the press too by you know doing stuff like accepting private plane trips to stay with Elton yeah. John and so on. I mean, they're harmless crimes, but they're just not what the royals do. You know, that 
she didn't go to the, the Balmoral to stay with the Queen. She turned down that invitation. Yeah. Instead, she went off to the south of France with, I mean, frankly, I can't think of anything worse than going to Balmoral to stay with the Queen. And I too would have way preferred to go and stay <laughs> in the south of France on, yeah. on in Elton John's fabulous yeah. house. I mean, and, no. she would have, and she must have thought, you know, what, what am I getting out of this? I mean, you know, I have these goodies being offered to me and I can't take them. Yeah. You know, I mean, so that's really where, you know, the rot sort of set in for the two of them. And of course, Harry's fury with the press yeah. also, you know, they, they essentially, they they validated each other's grievances. And that yeah. can, you know, in, in marriage, you either have someone who successfully, who is a kind of foil and you you sort of calm each other down, or you can have a situation where yeah, the two of you feed off each other. Each other up. You talk about how it's the the monarchy really the most important decision is who they marry. Do you think that Diana and Charles ever had a chance? Um, I don't think that Diana and uh, Charles had a chance given their age gap and given the fact that uh, because Diana was a very young 20 and Charles was a very old 32. I mean, yeah. Charles was like 32 going on 65. Yeah. But of course, less, you know, even more important, he was in love with somebody else. So, I mean, always was. And he did try, I think. I mean, I think he did try to give up Camilla, and uh, but they were so ill-suited. I happen to think that if Diana had married Charles at the, you know, where she was at the end of her life, if she had just met Charles at 36, uh, at the end of her life, I think it might have been a successful marriage. I mean, not a red-hot marriage in terms of what Diana would have liked because I don't think he would have ever had those kind of real feelings for her. But I think they could have been quite a successful working partnership. And it's ironic that at the end of her life, actually, uh, they were getting on rather well. That, I mean, Charles would go drop in for tea with her at Kensington Palace and they would talk about their philanthropies and they would talk about their work. And Diana was a very different woman at 36 from the one she was as a child. I mean, he married a child. I mean, in fact, that's the comment that Charles made about her. She's just a child. She yeah. was just a child. And, you know, frankly, I think when you consider that, you know, he married her at 20, uh, I mean, she was a child. She absolutely was a child. And and she was totally uneducated child, too, by the way. She left school at 16 to be a child's nanny. Yeah. And she marries this, you know, quite, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, educated, rather, you know, sort of very Just, rather set in ways already. Yeah. I mean, it was hope. If Charles was given a chance to marry Camilla earlier, he would have been... Slightly, do you think she would have calmed him down and he would have? Yes. Yes. I think I think Charles's tragedy, which nobody really cares about, <laughs> nobody finds it interesting, but it is, I think, uh, a great love affair that yeah. somehow people don't feel romantic about. I actually do. I mean, I think that, you know, Camilla, he fell in love with Camilla in his early 30s and he stayed in love with her. He's now 75, nearly. I mean, he just wanted to be married to this woman. Um, she was the person he wanted to be with and he couldn't. So he went off and he had all these other affairs and he was trying to do the right thing. And, you know, she she married and continued, uh, you know, her husband was a philanderer and so she and she continued yeah. having the affair with Charles. But he always really wanted to be with Camilla. And I think there's something very appealing about the fact that he really wanted to be with this age appropriate, country loving, not particularly yeah. svelte, certainly not glamorous a uh, woman who shared his interests. Yeah. <laughs> so just, if it was anybody she, else, we would have probably thought it was a grand love affair. It would have I been mean, I mean, you know, She, she yeah. was his soulmate, yeah. and that's who he wanted to be with. So for Charles, it was a total tragedy as well. I mean, yeah. and on top of that, he had to be cast as the villain in the story all the time. Um, I mean, he could not handle this absolute superstar young wife who, who was very emotionally fragile, who was possessive beyond belief, who couldn't, deal with the fact that she didn't own Charles's sort of love because he yeah. she didn't I mean she understood it wasn't so much that she believed Camilla that he was always being unfaithful to Camilla although she came to believe that she knew she never really had him and that was what tormented her an older woman of that sphere I mean I couldn't stand marrying someone who I felt that about but I mean in that in that upper class sphere there are plenty of marriages where People kind of accept those kind of incomplete partnerships, and they and they and they do things on the side. That's not what Diana wanted to do. She was a romantic, which was the yeah. problem. You talk about fragility. It's a theme in your book, in some ways that all of them are actually looking for approval. Charles was looking for for his from his father approval from his father. Uh, this this need, you know, we talk about motherhood. 
Um, and, you know, you talk about the queen, you talk about the queen of Mount Patton and her sort of going off and leaving, uh, leaving her, her child for four months. How much of it is also about approval? It's this large family where duty comes first, but it's everybody sort of looking for each other. Before. How much, how is that theme? How does it play out with everybody? Well, I mean, you know, the Winces are undoubtedly, you know, a fascinatingly dysfunctional family, just as so many of the ma massive, um, uh, you know, dynasties, as you yeah. said at the beginning, you know, uh, uh, of India are. I mean, yeah. you know, when 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 Meghan talked about, you know, all of these difficulties with the family and the things, I thought to myself, try marrying into the Ambani family. Yeah, true. <laughs> I mean, sorry, but I mean, I, I, I think that I'm not suggesting there's anything particularly bad about them. I just think that it probably isn't easy for, say, for, say an American girl married into the Albani family, probably very difficult, just as it is to marry into the Rupert Murdoch family or, you know, into, you know, the Rothschild family. I mean, these big dynastic families are very difficult places, you know, places to inhabit. And by the way, it doesn't mean you don't have to be a dynastic family to have problems with your mother-in-law, as you yeah. well know, in India, or indeed, yeah. you know, I mean, look what uh, uh, um, Indira Gandhi and you know. Yeah, exactly. had to, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, mother -in -law. I mean, really, it's 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 really difficult. So uh, I don't think that the Winces are that different, really, from from any of these kind of families. As a matter of fact, um, I think that to survive in them, you have to be willing to sort of drink the Kool Aid and decide, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, learn the rules. And play them to my best advantage, and that is what I mean, she actually has learned how to operate inside it, and that is what, of course, uh, Kate has done. I mean, Kate is, I think, one of the most amazing figures in this entire story because yeah. here is this girl from, you know, affluent middle class family uh, in in the country, and you know, when she married William in two thousand and twelve, people said, you know, how will uh, how will this girl from just a you know a middle class family you know, ever adjust to becoming the future queen. Well, now people say, how would the family survive without her? Because, you know, again, family has turned out to be very, very important yet again, because Kate's family are a very solid family, just as Camilla's family is. You know, this, this critical thing you have to have to be able to sort of live and survive in these situations is your own support system. Mm -hmm. Camilla's support system was a very, very loving, uh, you know, supportive family and siblings. Same thing with Kate. I mean, her family have been remarkable ring of steel around her. You know, her mother, Carol, is one of my favorite characters because she is the archetypal, yeah. uh, you know, managing mother, if you like, without being heavy handed. She has helped to guide and steer and shield mm. and encourage and, and push and, you know, all of the things uh, to get Kate where she is, essentially. Mm. And she's Kate's confidant, which means that Kate's uh, secrets don't yeah. end up in the press. Her two siblings have been immensely Very loyal, you know, yeah, yeah. Pippa and, and, and her brother James. Honestly, the, the Middleton family should get their own Nobel Prize for, for, for sort of just creating a situation where the monarchy can survive because that's that's what Kate has had from that background. And it's made her a very stable, composed individual. Yeah, you say that that is the that is the marriage that is the most important for the monarchy. That absolutely. I mean, if the Cambridge marriage fell apart, I would, I would have very very slim hopes for the monarchy succeeding. How do you think? I mean, you know, the 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 cash from the UAE stuffed in Portland in bags aside, what do you see Charles's when Charles becomes king? How do you see that? Well, I think Charles is obviously a transitional monarch. We don't know how short his reign will be, but he does. I mean, he at least is stepping into the role at a time when his own passions, namely organic farming, you know, climate, yeah. uh, 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 yeah. you know, endangerment, etc. These things now are also those of the nation and of the world. And he was mocked and mocked for having these concerns, you know, for yeah. decades. But he was ahead of his time. I mean, he was immensely prescient about it all. And that, in a sense, gives him a, a kind of stature. So he can, I think, be a great convener. I think that he will use his position as king and Buckingham Palace to bring together people who share like-minded views about uh, about the environment and the protection of it, about um, uh, youth unemployment, which he cares mm -hmm. enormously about. Uh, you know, he's he's got a lot of 
uh, you know, insights into 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 his various causes, which happen to be very you know modern uh, now after years of not being. So mm-hmm. I actually think he's going to use that and do that very well. I mean, he will have to. Uh, he's going to have to downsize as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's already talking about making Balmoral a um, museum of the Queen. He doesn't actually want to live there. He prefers Burkhall, which is the house uh, on the estate that used to belong to the Queen Mother. He's very happy there. He has no desire to, to be in Balmoral Castle. Uh, you know what will happen to Sandringham? That will be a question. Uh, Windsor Castle is supposed to be uh, right now uh, earmarked for the Cambridges uh, because. Mm-hmm. Guess what? It's very near her mother. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love the idea that, like, oh, let's live in Windsor Castle. It's very much near my. It's very near my mum, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that is kind of, I think, far more of a pull for Kate than than the fact that it's Windsor Castle. Um. So you know, he's he's looking at all of that, um. While at the same time trying to keep a little bit of a mystique, and that's where he's got a problem because Charles has no mystique, and the Queen yeah. had the mystique of seventy years of history, and she never gave an interview. Yeah. Right. We know too much yeah. about Charles. Yeah. So let's hope his reign is um, uh, his reign ought to be about really preparing things for William. And if he can do that successfully and then step out, things will be fine. Depends how long it goes on. How important do you think mystique is, especially in an age of social media, for you to keep the institution of monarchy alive? I think mystique is is. Uh, very important and I, I I don't know how you I don't know how you have it in this age that's going to be something they have to try to figure out I think William so far is treading a pretty good line about speaking but being careful about what he says uh every time they do speak it's a disaster as we've seen whether it's yeah. Oprah or Martin Bashir or Prince Andrew speaking not a good idea you talk about marriage and you said that was the most important decision and you talk about perhaps a love story we really don't see very much, which is the Queen and Prince Philip. Um, You know, the bedrock of all stories. She again went against convention and what her mother told her, and mothers are usually right. Um, And she sort of followed her heart. So can you talk about that? Yes, it was one of the few times that the Queen decided that she wasn't gonna listen to anybody. Um, uh, she, this was a great marriage. It had its problems, you know, no, um, Philip did have, uh, everybody says, uh, around him, you know, did have something of a roving eye, but he was absolutely devoted to serving her, to being the consort and the spouse that she required. And she kept him, she, he kept her real. Uh, that was the best thing he did for the queen. She, he was funny, abrasive in his own way, of course, uh, you know, often, did very uh, uh, embarrassing or politically un- incorrect things, but she he kept her real, and he she knew he would always tell her the truth, and he did. And um, you know he vowed to to be her liege lord, you know, uh, uh, who would serve her, and he did, right to the end. And uh, it's a very moving story actually because she adored him, uh, adored him, and in his own way, a different way, uh, he was devoted to her.